Morning, everybody. Morning. Who's ready to talk some more trash? Yeah. Uh, quick reminder, next week is Mother's Day. So make sure that you put that premium priority, get the flowers order, whatever you got to do, so you're ready for next weekend. Also, be praying for our men. They're on a retreat this weekend, so we're hoping that they come back refreshed and excited and ready to set the pace morally. I want you guys to fill in the blank this morning. Take out the paper and the... Or you don't get no spending cash, yakety yak. Hey... They don't make lyrics like that anymore. That used to be number one in the 1950s. It shows the common struggle between parents yelling at their kids to take out the trash and then kids complaining about it. How many of you had to take out the trash when you were younger? How many of you ever complained about having to take out the trash? Yeah, most of us did at some point. Uh, Yakety yak. I mean, it's so difficult to carry out that 15-pound bag to the can and then wheel it to the road. I mean, in the medieval times, they had it so much easier where they had to bury their stuff by digging it with their hands. It's actually really easy to take out garbage. We shouldn't complain. Well, we've all grown up with the luxury of being able to put it on the side of the road and some magic truck comes along, grabs it, and takes it away from us. That was not always true throughout human history. In fact, For centuries in Europe, it was a common practice to actually take your garbage and just throw it out the window and hope that wild animals would just carry it off. That was how they dealt with garbage. But they also had the bubonic plague, rats the size of Mickey Mouse, and no sense of smell, which is why they all like stinky cheese. Limburger, blue cheese, and there's one called Stinking Bishop. Like a real bishop, it will make you want to repent. God wants us to deal with our garbage. God wants us to deal with our garbage, whether it's a trashy attitude, a habit, sense of humor, whatever it is. We all have garbage that we carry around with us morally, emotionally, mentally. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us or purify us from all unrighteousness. The only thing standing between unrighteousness and righteousness is that little word, if. If we confess, God is ready to come along and take that trash and remove it from us. He doesn't want to just forgive us. He wants to free us and to remove the garbage from our lives. One of the first books a Jewish kid would read would be the book of Leviticus. Now, that's not an are you my mother kind of book. It's a pretty intense first book to be learning as a kid. There's weird laws like you can eat crickets. You can't eat bacon. Don't wear clothes that are made out of two different materials. Some of us are violating that already this morning. Uh, God prefers savory over sweet. You can't put honey with any of the sacrifices, but you're to put salt on all of the meat. Yay, God. But they had these strange rules so that they would stand out, so that they'd be different, so that they could make a difference. Now, many Christians act like it's our job to camouflage ourselves, to try and blend in, but God wants us to be salt, and like he wants us to stand out, to be different, to make a difference. It has to, one of the reasons why Leviticus was the first book that they would read is it has more direct speeches from God than any other book in the Pentateuch. Leviticus was right in the middle of the first five books that Moses wrote. And let's say them together this morning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Which one's in the middle? Leviticus. Strategically placed in the middle, not because of chronology, but because it was considered sacred And what's interesting is that right in the middle of Leviticus is chapter 16. It was considered the holy of holy of passages. In Leviticus chapter 16, it was where the day of atonement was outlined. The holiest day of the year is in the middle of the Pentateuch, strategically. Showing that this day, the only day where the high priest could go into the holy of holies... What was fascinating about it is on that day, they would have a goat that they would place their hand on, signifying their sins being placed onto the goat, and then the goat would carry it around, almost like a moral garbage truck, carrying their garbage away from the community, and then they would celebrate. The high priest placed his hands on the goat's head, and the priest would confess over the animal all of Israel's sins. The animal then go out of the camp into the desert, symbolizing all their sins have been carried away from. Could you imagine the looks on their faces if that goat had made its way back into the camp? Now, I can't even imagine what the reaction would be. 
But it represented that Israel's sins had been carried away. Listen to how the author of Hebrews describes Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Jesus was the scapegoat. Jesus carried our sins away, but unlike the goat, it didn't have to happen every year. Jesus, it was one and done. Your garbage has been permanently taken away from you, so stop carrying your trash everywhere. As Christians, we are supposed to get rid of our garbage, but too often we're like Oscar the Grouch, and we become comfortable living amongst our garbage. It becomes normative, but that's not God's desire for us. God wants us to not live with envy and regret and foolishness and bitterness. God's desire is for us to live with freedom. Amen? Amen. All right. This morning, we're going to talk about one more. We're going to talk about a real big one. Everyone say it with me. Anger. Now say it like you're angry. Anger. All right. We know who struggles with anger. Anger. Anger is what Packers fans felt when they heard that Aaron Rodgers didn't want to play for them anymore. That's the emotion that they experienced. And he happened to do so on the worst day, draft day. Anger. How many of you have ever said or done something stupid when you were angry? How many of you are sitting next to someone who's ever done or said something stupid while they were angry? Yeah, you, you would raise your hand, but you don't want to make them angry. Um, so uh, most of us have all struggled with anger at some point and done something dumb, like slam a golf club on the green, give the silent treatment, but don't explain why you're giving the silent treatment, yell at your boss, lose your job, tell your spouse what you really think about them, sleep on the couch, send that nasty email, Facebook, text, whatever. When I was in high school, I dated a girl, and I was in love. I could tell because she irritated me a lot. I see some of you also are in love. One time I got so angry, I actually punched a stop sign. And let's just say I should have listened to the sign. It was the stupidest thing I've ever done. Another time I got so mad, I listened to country music. I have not forgiven her for that. Yeah. Uh, I thought it might make me feel better to listen to the song, All My Exes Live in Texas. And that's why I live in Tennessee, but it didn't help. One night while I was hanging out with a bunch of my friends, a couple of them informed me that she had been cheating on me with my best friend. And if I was David Banner, I would have changed into the Incredible Hulk. If I was a news anchor, I would have changed into Bill O'Reilly. I was was angry. I uh, I don't know if I've ever been as mad as I was that night. I experienced what some might call the Jim Carrey syndrome. The more I got mad and madder, the more I got dumb and dumber. Mm -hmm. When I was at the boiling point, I drove to her house, confronted her, and challenged him to a fist fight. I said something stupid like, I'll hit you so hard, Chuck Norris will be impressed. (laughs) He refused to come outside because I had a whole carload worth of guys with me ready to help beat him up. I think they're all pastors now. (laughs) By the end of the night, my girlfriend broke up with me and my best friend wanted nothing to do with me. And to make matters worse, come to find out none of it was true. Yeah. I should have listened to the words of Job, chapter 5, verse 2. Anger kills a fool, and envy slays the simple. Anger kills a fool. I hate to think about how many friendships, families, congregations, and countries have been destroyed because someone got mad, because someone had that short fuse. I was in a parking lot yesterday with my kids, and a guy was driving the wrong way when he about ran into my van. Now, I'm going the right way. He's going the wrong way. He about runs into me, and all of a sudden, he goes to the Rolodeck of every swear word he has ever heard from kindergarten till now. He, I've, I've not seen someone turn that red that fast. I mean, his blood pressure must have been through the roof. He looked like a Dragon Ball character attempting to Super Saiyan <laughs> ah, for like three episodes. Like, wow. My kids were literally laughing because the guy was so ridiculous. I was like trying to get them. I was like, don't laugh out loud. I mean, he might have a gun or something. I mean, come on, guys. You make things worse. They got no street smarts. Like Sesame Street's the only smarts, street smarts that they got. (laughs) Settle down. When King Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took over the kingdom. 
And the 12 tribes come to him and they're like, hey, your dad was pretty rough on us. Would you be willing to, to be a little more merciful, a little more gracious? And, and this was his response out of anger. He says, my little finger is bigger than my dad's waist. You thought he was hard. Wait until you encounter me. You know what happened to Israel? At that point, it was split in two, and they lost 10 of the 12 tribes, and it was never the same again, all because of his impulsive anger response. Anger can be catastrophic in what it does to families, communities. Have you ever noticed how interchangeable the phrases, I'm angry and I'm mad, have become? You realize mad is like insane, but we've made them interchangeable. Kids warn each other, watch out, mom or dad is what? They're mad. Coke workers watch out, say steer clear of the boss because he's mad. Spouses push each other away, say give me a little space because I'm mad. But can a person become angry without becoming mad? Does anger always have to manifest itself in a frenzied behavior? Destructive, dangerous, out of control, yes, sinful. Well, most of us are temperamental. Can you have temper without the mental? Can you be angry and not be mad? The Apostle Paul seemed to think so when he said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, be angry and sin not. Let's read that together. Be angry and sin not. Let's say it again. Be angry and sin not. We are commanded to be angry, but to do so in a way that's not sinful. And that's the struggle. To be angry and to sin not. Many of us get angry, but then we start becoming sinful by cussing and slamming dishes and gossiping and posting embarrassing pictures and, and acting like two-year-olds, throwing temper tantrums. I was driving home and I saw two guys outside having to dispute. They're in the middle of the road circling each other. You can almost hear the Clint Eastwood song. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, they're out there circling each other. And my window's down so I can hear the whole conversation. And one of them's like, bring it on, old man. I'll whoop your butt. It's like some strong language going on. And the guy's like, you wish. <laughs> they both take a couple of really slow swings at each other. You can tell when people have never like, had an actual fight. And they're like, like way back here announcing what they're going to do. It's like this big slow motion swing. And like clearly, you know, I mean, they were social distancing before COVID. You know, like six feet away, like nowhere even close to the person. And then all of a sudden the light change is green and the guy goes to you know, jump in and he's like, you better move your motorcycle, I'll run it over. And the, other, the younger guy starts chanting, 2467DH, this is the license plate. And then it ends with the guy like, ooh, I'm scared. <laughs> now I did say these are grown men, right? These were adults acting like toddlers, but that's what anger does to us. It reduces us to childishness foolishness. We see examples of anger all the time. A guy wrote that if I had, if I wrote on Twitter, the sky is blue, I'm guaranteed there's going to be people who are going to respond, my kids are colorblind. You are so insensitive. <laughs> we live in a culture right now where people are looking for an excuse to rage, constantly on the hunt for something. I get ner I don't fear public speaking, but I fear now public interpretation. Because it doesn't matter what you say, someone is going to find something to complain about. Like, I cannot believe Pastor Dan said the sky is blue. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> but that's the culture we're living in right now. It's the default emotion is anger. It's anger. Whether a person implodes or explodes, we tend to see a whole lot more examples of sinful anger than righteous anger. There's a moment where Ezra gets so fired up and so angry at a bunch of guys that he starts pulling his own beard out. Very next book, Nehemiah, he gets so angry at a couple of guys, he starts pulling their beard out. <laughs> I like his reaction better than Ezra's. <laughs> but neither one of them are a healthy response for beards. You know, it's just not a good way to grow beards. Now, being angry is not a sin. We need to hear that. Being angry is not a sin. Many people assume that anger is a bad thing. If a person gets angry, they must be spiritually immature. Because if I was really mature spiritually, I would never have anger. But the more spiritually mature you are, the more righteous anger you will experience because the more of the heartbeat of God you will have. And there are things that get God fired up. 
There are things that make God angry. Throughout scripture, we read that God's anger was stimulated by sin, rebellion, and evil, and injustice. In Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, it states, God's anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. I love that verse. David admits that God gets angry. He gets fired up. But his anger is always mixed with mercy and grace and a desire to forgive and to heal if people will respond appropriately. God doesn't like getting fired up. God doesn't want that to be the default emotion. But people do stupid things and it triggers his anger. I've been speed reading through the Bible for a project I'm doing. And it's a little bit like power walking through a museum. You know, just kind of like going through. And one of the things that really stood out to me, how many of you guys ever saw Night at the Museum? Remember the monkey Dexter? He's like cute, but he like slaps everybody. That was the prophets. You know, they, they said some cute things, but they had no problem slapping people. You know, they would represent God and let people know when they were getting out of control and God was angry with them. Anger is not a sin, but why we're angry and what we do with the anger, that's what becomes sinful. Why we're angry, what we do with the anger, that's where it becomes sinful. Anytime we become angry, we get to make the same choice. Will we use our anger constructively or destructively? Positively or negatively? On Jersey Shore, Mike, the situation got so mad that he headbutted a wall and knocked himself out. That's a bad example of anger. Don't be stupid. Solomon once said, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. I love that. He who rules his spirit. You can either control your emotions or your emotions can control you. You can control your anger or your anger can control you. You've all experienced this. You've been on the phone, and you're taught, let's put it this way, you're in the room, you're talking with one of your siblings, and you're really letting them have it. I can't believe you. And you're going and going and going, and all of a sudden a phone call. Hey, Stacy. In that moment, you controlled your emotions. You have the ability to change channels, to redirect those feelings. Now you need to start doing it for the ones closest to you, the ones that you love, the friends, the family members. I'm going to outline a better way to deal with anger, and it's going to spell the word peace. Everyone say peace. All right. First is pause. Listen to the words of Nehemiah. When I heard their outcry in these charges, I was very angry. Everyone say very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. Notice Nehemiah doesn't respond impulsively. He doesn't get very angry and then lash out, but he takes the time to ponder them. There's a pause before he directs his anger. One of the biggest problems with anger is that we often respond impulsively. We feel like I got to say something, I got to do something, and I got to do it right now. Now, Scripture does say don't let the sun go down on your anger, so you do need to take care of it, but it doesn't say deal with it in the moment. Sometimes you need to take a minute to think, to pray, to ask God, is this righteous indignation or is this selfish indignation? Am I justified in my feelings right now? A disc jockey was on the air when he told a pinup girl that he would be willing to leave his wife and two kids for her while his wife happened to be listening to that radio program. Instantly, she went on Facebook and she says, I need to get rid of his car immediately. Ideally, in the next two to three hours before my cheating husband gets home to find it gone and all his belongings in the street. I am the registered owner and I have the logbook. Please only buy if you can pick it up tonight. Within 45 seconds, she sold his $45,000 sports car for 90 cents. I'm sure she felt great about that until the next bill payment came in for that car. We can feel really good about our impulsive response to our anger. It's like, ah, I stuck it to him. But regret is a real pain in the butt. You have to live with what you did with that anger. Yes, you got to act impulsively. Yes, you got to hit that thing, say that thing. But now you got to live with the consequences of what you did. And even though you say sorry, it doesn't magically make it all go away. 
How many of you have ever dialed the wrong number? Yes. A few years ago, I dialed the wrong number, and when I apologized, the other guy on the other end rudely said to me, you dialed the wrong number because you're a moron. <laughs> For those of you who are visiting, I have the gift of sarcasm. <laughs> I am not the guy to say you're a moron. Taking the bait, I said, oh, how does that make me a moron? I should have just hung up. He said, I'll prove you're a moron. Quote a line from Shakespeare's Macbeth. I said, I will gladly do that if you can quote John 3.16. He said, how am I supposed to know John 3.16? I said, it is only the most popular verse from the most popular book, and it's at every sporting event. <laughs> Macbeth is not. At that point, who's the moron? Both of us. <laughs> Anger has a way of sneaking up on us, ruining our day, relationships, perspective, sense of connection to God. We need to pause and ponder. Next word, examine. Everyone say examine. We need to ask, why am I angry? Is my anger justified? Anger is the person... How many of you have ever gotten angry when you see a person who's in like the 15 items or less checkout and they've got like 16 items? Yeah, you get like fired. It's like one more item, but it's like, this is unjust. Or you get angry if the person walks slowly across the parking lot when you wave them across. And it's like, hey, you know, go ahead. And they're like, it's almost like they slow down. <laughs> I, I hate it. I hate it. Here's the worst one. Someone offers you a cookie and it looks like chocolate chips, but it's raisins. That's what's called holy indignation. God understands that anger. You know, out of all the stuff we've talked about, that one is okay. Anger is not a primary emotion. It is generally a result of another emotion like hurt, frustration, fear. It's not a primary emotion. It's often fueled by another secondary emotion that you need to dig in and figure out what's going on. So let's imagine it's the middle of the night. It's pitch dark. Suddenly you hear something in the basement and you're you know, just about sound asleep and your spouse also starts elbowing you and says, hey, did you hear that? And you do like the normal spouse thing, no, I did not. You know you heard it, but no, I didn't hear it. So you try to go back to sleep, and all of a sudden there's some more, and she elbows you again. Hey, did you hear that? No, I didn't hear that. She's like, well, on the news, there was a person who broke out of a, an insane asylum, and they've got an ax, and they're going around in our neighborhood. I think it's them. You need to go check it out. And you, being an equal opportunity person, who believes that men and women should have the same rights, say, why don't you go check it out, babe? To which he says, I can't. I'm in my nightgown. I don't have no makeup on. He's like, that's perfect. He'll see you with no makeup and will not want to stay. <laughs> to which she's like, get to stepping. <laughs> so dutifully, you get up and you say, fine, I'll go down to my BVDs and I'll take care of it. And you're angry. You're angry. For a couple of reasons. One, because you're frustrated, you got to get out of bed. You want to be sleeping right now. Two, you're actually a little scared there might be someone in your house. Three, you can't believe your spouse would send you down there to face this homicidal maniac while she crawls out the window to safety. <laughs> Whenever we get angry, we need to step back and ask, what's underneath my anger? What's fueling my anger? There's a scene in the book of Mark where Jesus sees this fig tree and it says in Mark, it's not the season for figs. It's very strategic. It says it's not the season for figs. But Jesus goes up to it wanting a fig and gets angry at it and curses it. At first, this seems kind of impulsive. Like, Jesus, what's going on? It's not the season for figs. You shouldn't be angry at the tree right now. It would be like going to McDonald's and say, hey, can I have a pizza? And they're like, we don't serve pizza. And then you get mad at them. You know? But what's interesting is that Mark uses what's called a sandwiching technique. He will start a story. He'll pause. He'll start telling a different story, and then he'll come back to the original one, and they're all tied together. In this, he'll start the fig tree story. Jesus will curse it. Then Jesus will go into the temple, and then he'll come back to the fig tree, and the fig tree will be withered up. It has nothing to do with the fig tree. The fig tree symbolizes the temple, and it symbolizes what God is about to do in AD 70, which is going to come and destroy the temple. Okay? What Jesus is saying is that you are not being fruitful. Therefore, God is going to come and destroy this temple. 
His anger was justified. We need to examine why am I angry. Third part is we need to admit. Admit. We need to admit our part of the equation. When we get angry, it's so easy for us to see them as the villain and we're the victim. And it's hard for us to see our part of the situation and why things are going the way that they're going. How we, think about de- how we often think determines how angry we become. Once again, imagine it's late at night and you've got a toddler. And it's been an easy day, no problems. You're in the basement watching some TV and you hear that toddler coming down the stairs. And you think to yourself, aw, that's cute. Braving the dark, braving the possibility of getting in trouble, sneaking down the stairs. They got a little bit of me in them, a little adventure. They're willing to come down and see what's going on. You know, there's only so many more Instagram moments I'm going to have with them, and they're going to outgrow it, and I just want to cherish this moment. Now imagine it's a different night. It's been a very stressful day because you have to write this stupid sermon about anger that you gotta deliver the next day. And that same kid starts coming down the stairs. Your thoughts are a little bit different, a little bit darker. How dare they defy the laws of God and their parents, they're disobeying, coming down the stairs. What you gotta ask yourself, do you feel lucky, punk? (laughs) (laughs) Wah, 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 wah. Um, Same situation, but what's going on inside totally changes the way in which you respond to what's going on. Okay, next is confront the person or problem. Confront, everyone say confront. Sometimes the situation deserves a kerfuckle. Fuffle. Kerfuffle. Don't say it the way I did. It sounds really terrible and someone's going to pause it and it's going to sound like a really bad word. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 27. (laughs) Pastor Dan went viral. Why? Why? he doesn't know how to say kerfuffle. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 27. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Do not give the devil a foothold with your anger. In other words, deal with your anger. Don't stuff it. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend that it's no big deal. How many of you are a stuffer? You just take that anger. You just keep putting it down and putting it down and putting it down. All of a sudden, it starts becoming toxic, and it starts leaking out in ways that you did not anticipate. There are times when we are justified in our anger and we need to say or do something about it. Moses needed to confront Israel when they created an idol in the shape of a golden calf, just as God was saying, do not create any idols before me. He had to confront them. David needed to get angry when Goliath was insulting God and God's people. He had to get angry and do something about it. Paul needed to get angry when Peter was treating non-Jews as second-class citizens. In the book of Galatians, he puts them on blast for everyone for thousands of years to be able to read about. He had to get angry and do something. Just as fear signals danger and loneliness lets us know that we need to connect with people, anger lets us know that there's something that needs to be done. In fact, some of the people who are changing this world for the better are motivated by anger. Anger at injustice anger at the way things are going, and they're angry, and they're doing something positive about it. For example, Candace Lightyear created Mothers Against Drunk Driving, or MAD, because her young girl was hit by a drunk driver and killed. She got angry, and she did something about it. Now, drunk driving cases are down 20% because of Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. She made a positive difference because she allowed her anger to fuel her to do something constructive with it. Many people who work hard to make the world a healthier place are fueled by righteous indignation. The last one, express. Everyone say express. We need to express our anger with grace, forgiveness, and kindness. A couple of guys were talking at a men's retreat. One of the guys said, I need to let you guys know a story. My wife and I got into a little argument the other night, and I just want you guys to know, she came crawling on her hands and knees. Impressed, the guys were like, wow, what did she say? She said, get from under the bed and fight like a man. (laughs) When we express our anger, we need to do so with grace. Kindness, forgiveness. 
We need to remember how God has acted towards us in spite of his wrath. He's always shown us mercy. Showed us great. If God treated us the way that we deserve to be treated, not one of us would be standing here right now. But he has extended mercy and grace. Scripture states that God takes our sin and tosses it into the sea of forgetfulness. And then puts up a no fishing sign. Don't go back to your trash. We need to extend the same kind of grace to others. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, which we read last week, but it deserves repeating. says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. When we follow these five steps, we can respond to anger with peace rather than destruction. Before there was Dr. J., Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. There was a basketball player named Pistol Pete. Have you ever heard of Pistol Pete? A skinny little white guy who just was magical with his dribbling and his passing. And he averaged 44.2 points a game, would dominate. Did you know that he died of a massive heart attack playing a pickup game of basketball at the age of 40? Physically, he looked like the epitome of health. Played professional game after game after game at a high level. And then one day was just playing a little pickup game with some friends and died instantly at the age of 40. When the doctors examined him, the autopsy revealed that he was actually born with a congenitive heart defect. He had had it his whole life. Rather than having two coronary arteries, he only had one. Externally, he looked great, but internally, there was a problem with his heart that he did not know about and others did not know about. That describes many Christians today. Walking around feeling like they've got it right because they're comparing themselves to the person next to them rather than comparing themselves to Christ and realizing that there is trash that they are carrying around in their heart. Garbage that Jesus wants to deal with. When we carry around foolishness, bitterness, regret, and anger that's undealt with, we struggle. It's toxic. And a lot of it comes down to there are things and people that we need to forgive. Whose face comes to mind when I say anger, unforgiveness, Most of us have someone in our life that we struggle with. I'll tell you who I have the hardest time with, but to do so, I need you guys to finish this sentence for me. Thou shall not... They say that whenever you do the fill in the blank out of the Ten Commandments, the one you say is the one you struggle with the most. Thou shall not kill. I'm kind of scared that out of this group, that that's the only one out of the Ten Commandments is the default that everyone goes through. Thou shall not kill. I mean, there's a lot of them we could choose from, like thou shall not covet, you know, but thou shall not kill. All right, guys, settle down now. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. That's not really a thing. Um, <laughs> that's actually like the default that most people go to. But there is ten. I'm just throwing it out there. For me, uh, Exodus 20:15, thou shall not steal. The people I struggle with the most have all stolen something from me. I hate thieves. I hate thieves. I, I work so hard to do what I do, achieve what I do. And so for someone to steal, I just, it's hard for me to let go of that. It's hard for me to forgive that. And so I have a couple of them that, that will come to my mind. There's a person who stole my computer from the church here. It was my own personal computer. And I could replace the computer, but I cannot replace all the footage of my kids from when they were little that was on that computer that's gone forever. I I will never get that back. And every time I think about it, I just begin to rage again, and there's anger within me. Um, But even bigger to me is there was a lot of sermons that were on there, and people forget 72% within, no, 90% within 72 hours. I could have re-preached those sermons and saved myself a lot of time (laughs) if that person hadn't stolen them. So, I mean, that's that's a sore subject for me. Uh, (laughs) There was another one that actually I, I led to the Lord, uh, I led him to Christ, and, uh, and he didn't have a vehicle, and he was trying to get on his feet. And so me and my wife, we had a second vehicle. We were like, we're going to do a deal, and we're going to sell it to him for super cheap, and he stole it instead. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to finish the rest of that story because it just gets dark. But it's hard for me to forgive those people. It's hard for me to let go of those things. And when I think about it, it's almost like gasoline on a dumpster fire. 
Any of you have like someone like that? It's like you just you think about them and it just brings out the darkness. But here's the deal. Forgiveness is not one and done. You don't just forgive a person and then just magically goes away. Forgiveness is one of those things that every time it comes up, you have to re-forgive that person, re-forgive that thing. It's an ongoing process. Forgiveness isn't friendship. I will never be friends with those people. Reconciliation is totally different than forgiveness. You can forgive the person and not have them in your life, okay? And, and people make that mistake. They feel like as Christians, well, I forgave them, so now we've got to have them over for Thanksgiving. We've got to be best friends. That's not biblical forgiveness. Reconciliation requires them taking some steps to become a better person and trust to be reestablished. That includes spouses, just throwing that out there. All right. Forgiveness is not about letting them back into my life. Sometimes forgiveness is the only way to get them out of my life. I'm going to say that again. Forgiveness is sometimes the only way to get them out of my life. It's letting go of their influence over my emotions mentally and physically. As long as I'm allowing them to walk around in my mind, they have control over me. And they're continuing to hurt me. Forgiving is for living. The person who suffers the most when we can't forgive is ourselves. We only hurt ourselves. Maybe someone stole your innocence, your identity, your spouse, and you need God's strength and perspective to forgive that person so that you can diffuse that toxic anger and finally let it go. Some of us have been carrying around that trash everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. Hey, let me tell you about my best friend Jesus. He brings love and joy. Ah, anger is still in there. You realize that every time you allow anger to take control, you are marring your witness. You can talk about, to your friends about how much you go to church and how much Bible you read and all these wonderful things that you check off the box, but if this is dominating you, your witness isn't that great. We need God to deal with our anger, to allow us to forgive and to finally start to move on so that we can walk in wholeness, to allow God to take out the paper and the trash and never take it back, to let it go, to be behind us and say, all right, God, I want my heart to reflect your heart. I want my mind to reflect your mind. I want to live and love as Jesus lived and loved. 